Hi, and welcome to your newborn video. I'm going to share my screen and get going on our lecture. Okay, so we're going to be discussing the newborn. After this lecture, you should have a fairly good understanding of the physiological adaptations that the newborn goes through, of the behavioral characteristics, and of the care management. That's the nursing care management. We'll divide that up into birth to two hours of life, two hours of life until discharge, and discharge planning and teaching. So we'll get started with the physiological adaptations. So we have our periods of reactivity and our periods of decreased responsiveness. We have two distinct periods of reactivity. The first occurs within 30 minutes after birth. At this time, the baby is alert. The baby's um, opening its eyes. It's looking around. It's searching for that breast. It's searching for that food. The baby might be crying um, and is just fairly active. It'll then go through a period of decreased responsiveness. The baby's probably going to want to sleep during this time. This is a good time for mom to sleep as well. The second period of reactivity occurs between two, or I'm sorry, of, oh yeah, reactivity occurs between two and eight hours after birth. And that's again, the baby's awake, um, moving around and trying to eat. <laughs> There's a phenomenon called the second night and that occurs on the second night, typically. And what that is, is that's baby's way of bringing mom's milk in. And what happens is baby just eats and eats and eats so that it can tell the mom's body, hey, I'm here and I'm ready, to, um, ready for you to produce some milk for me. So when we move on to the respiratory system, we have the initiation of breathing. So remember in utero, that baby's lungs are filled with fluid. So that first initial cry that the baby has when it's born is the initiation of breathing. And what happens there is those alveoli pop open and they stay open. And then the gas exchange is able to occur. If we have a baby who is um, preterm, we have a concern about those alveoli opening up because of the lack of surfactant. And that's one of the main reasons why we give the beta-methasone to those little babies because the beta-methasone helps the lungs mature and essentially it helps the surfactant develop because the surfactant acts almost like dish soap and it reduces the surface tension so those alveoli can stay open so they don't stay collapsed upon upon themselves. If we have a baby who is experiencing nasal flaring, so their nose is flaring out when they're breathing, grunting, or um, we have they're using their accessory muscles so they're retracting when they're breathing, those are all signs of respiratory distress. And we're going to want to watch that baby a little bit closer. If it happens within the first 30 minutes or so of life, that's okay because that baby is still transitioning to extra uterine life. If it happens after that, we're going to be a little bit more heightened. And anytime those things are occurring, we're watching that baby pretty closely. The baby just can't maintain all of that accessory muscle use to maintain breathing for very long. It just doesn't have the energy for that. As for the cardiovascular system, when we're looking at that, remember a lot of babies can have a little bit of a murmur that we hear. One, because of a lot of blood flowing through a tiny little heart, and two, because some of those, um, those fetal circulation openings, like the ductus soteriosus and the ductus venosus, might not have closed completely. So we're listening for heart murmurs. Um, and we're also going to be looking for risks for cardiovascular problems. That mostly we're going to see with cyanosis. Typically, we'll see cyanosis around the mouth um, and lips, and we'll see it on the chest and trunk. So remember, babies can have blue hands and feet, and that's totally normal for the first up to almost 48 hours of life. The hands and the feet aren't quite as important as the head and the heart and the lungs, right, the brain. 
We want those things to have that good, rich, oxygenated blood, whereas the hands and feet, not so much. So we're going to keep an eye on the coloring of those babies. Um, babies have a slightly increased blood volume when they're first born, and their blood pressure can reflect that. We really don't take blood pressures on neonates newborn, sorry, we would take it on neonates potentially in the NICU, but on a healthy newborn, we're not going to take a blood pressure. Keep in mind also that when babies code, and actually most pediatric patients or the pediatric population, when they code, it's most likely respiratory related. When adults go down, it's cardiac related, but when babies go down, it's respiratory related. So if we can get some, them some good oxygenation, they'll probably come out of whatever it was that caused the problem. Um, we'll want to e explore what the true cause is, but we can at least get them breathing and get their heartbeat back up again if with some good ventilation. So as for the hematopoietic system, so the blood that the baby has, so the baby is less efficient at oxygen exchange. So we have an increase in our red blood cells in our hemoglobin and hematocrit, and that's to give the baby more opportunity to carry the oxygen around. So we can see high levels of um, RBCs in your H&H &H is gonna be elevated after birth. We're also going to see um, stable platelets and leukocytes are going to potentially be elevated. They can range anywhere from 9,000 to 30,000. They will stabilize at about 12,000 a couple days after birth, but we can, um, we can actually miss a sepsis diagnosis because of those unstable leukocytes. The, the neutrophils um, we're going to see elevated in most babies as well. When we look at the blood group, the blood group is, is defined by the parent's genetics and the genetics of the baby or the parent's genetics coming down to the baby. And we're going to test the cord blood to determine what that blood type is, what the blood group the baby falls into. We're definitely concerned about the blood group for moms who are RH negative. Remember, we gave them that rogam early on in pregnancy, about 28 weeks. And if they are RH negative and baby comes back RH positive, then we're going to give them a second dose after delivery. So that's why we want to know about those, that blood group. Why, we, why do we care what the baby's blood type is? It's more along the lines for mom than it is for baby. And as for the thermogenic system, we're very concerned with the baby's heat. They don't have a lot of uh, thermoregulation. So we're going to be making sure that we keep our babies covered up. We're going to make sure that we don't have um, them open to their environment on a regular basis. When we do skin to skin with mom, we want to make sure that baby's covered up as well. Immediately after birth, we're going to dry that baby really well so that the baby doesn't get too cold. Babies have something called brown fat, and there's a great picture in your book on page 534. And the brown fat can be metabolized to produce heat. Babies don't shiver like adults do for um, the first couple weeks. It doesn't, that, that mechanism doesn't quite kick in to shiver and produce heat to warm, warm the body. So the baby's secondary mechanism is this brown fat that they can metabolize, um, which, which can heat up the baby. Now, preterm infants are born with less brown fat because the brown fat accumulates the further in gestation the baby gets. So our preterm babies are going to be very susceptible to that heat loss. We're going to want to keep very close eyes on them. In our micro preemies, those are born really early, like in the 20s for weeks, we're going to wrap them up in a piece of plastic, actually, so that they don't lose the heat. Um, and because it's such a such a challenge for them. And this next slide, we have the effects of cold stress. So you can see everything that happens when the baby gets cold and how it can lead to the to metabolic acidosis, which obviously we don't want. So we want to make sure that we definitely keep those kiddos covered up um, and dry to keep them nice and warm. Kind of. 
Um, so moving on to some more of the physiological adaptations. So for the renal system, babies have a slightly decreased kidney function. Uh, what that really translates to is a decreased ability to, do, to deal with the various events that could potentially cause an acidotic state. So like we just talked about with the cold stress, um, the, the babies, the bicarbonate, the exchange system isn't fully functioning. So they're at a heightened risk for becoming acidotic, which is what we want to be aware of. Their, their urine is also going to be a little bit less concentrated. So if we see a baby that has a severely concentrated urine and they're less than three months old, that's going to be a, a sign that there's something going on with that kidney function. We want to keep in mind that 75% of the body weight is um, the total body water. So that excretory system is really important. It's also a great way for us to see if the baby is eating effectively. So the baby will poop and pee if it's actually intaking food. And moving on to the gastrointestinal system, that's one thing that we can share with our moms and dads is that when the baby is effectively intaking enough breast milk, then they're gonna have poops and pees. So that's a great way for them to determine whether whether or not there is enough um, going in. Because if there's stuff coming out, there's stuff going in, right? Babies are born with a, an essentially sterile gut, which is one of the reasons why they um, don't produce the vitamin K, which is why we give them a vitamin K shot. Uh, after birth, but the, the sterile gut leads to a couple different things. One, the vitamin K, Two, it means that their first stool is also sterile, so we're not very concerned about the, um, the bacterial content in that first stool. It also looks very different. So that first stool is called meconium, and the meconium is a greenish, tarry, it's a very dark green, almost black tar, and it's very challenging to get off the baby's bottom too. So if it dries on that baby's bottom, we're going to have to scrub pretty hard to get it off. So we want to be cognizant of when that first stool of cure occurs. And the meconium can last for the first day or so, and then it usually transitions into something a little bit different. And then it becomes um, the poop of either the breastfed baby, which looks almost like... Um, mustard and it has little grainy seeds in it which is the milk proteins that are there um, and then it or it looks like regular poop which is going to be if a formula fed baby would be regular poop when we introduce formula to the gut we forever change the gut of the baby so if we have an exclusively breastfed baby we're going to have a different gut than we have for a formula formula fed baby which is a fairly interesting um, concept to think about, especially as it relates to gestational, or I'm sorry, to diabetes and, and things like that, that come down the line in the future. Um, as for the liver, babies are born with an immature liver, but it's also a very enlarged liver. It takes up about 40% of that abdominal cavity, and it's just growing and, and maturing in function. The liver is the secondary aspect of why we give the vitamin K, because that immaturity, it does not have um, those clotting factors aren't there and available to that baby to be able to effectively clot the blood. Um, so the liver will just continue to, to mature. Immune immunity is acquired. And so our newborn babies are born with essentially without an immune system. They have a very small amount of IgG and IgM antibodies present. So we want to encourage our moms to give the babies that colostrum if they can at the beginning because that's chock full of antibodies that the baby can use. And then as the baby gets exposed to the environment, it will produce more and more antibodies along the way. Um, breastfeeding babies are typically a little bit healthier because they get the antibodies from mom. It also is because mom is cl typically closer to baby when she's breastfeeding, phys physically closer to baby when she's breastfeeding. So she is being exposed to the same things that the baby's being exposed to. And her body develops the immunity that she's then able to pass on to the baby through the breast milk. 
Going back to the liver for a minute here, we're going to look at this slide, which talks about the breakdown of the red blood cells. So I said previously that babies have an increased number of red blood cells, increased amount of hemoglobin and hematocrit. So sometimes that can translate into jaundice. So this just gives you the, um, the breakdown of the red blood cells. So it goes broken down into hemoglobin, or there's hemoglobin present, right? There's four on each red blood cell. And when the hemoglobin gets broke down, broken down, we have the heme and the globin, and we have iron and bilirubin. <coughs> Sorry. And <clears throat> the plasma protein. And this is typically broken down through the liver and passed out through the feces and through the urine. And as you probably remember, the reason that poop is brown is because of hemoglobin, or I'm sorry, because of bilirubin. Bilirubin is what makes it brown. So thinking to men's surge, we're gonna be very concerned about that really light clay colored poop in some of our liver patients because it means their liver is not functioning appropriately. And we have the same concerns with our babies. And theirs is just because their liver isn't fully developed yet. So they don't have the full capability to break down quite as much in certain cases. When we look at this, we see the, um, the hyperbilirubinemia, that's another hard one to say, um, risk. So we're going to take a look at our numbers here. And you can see that the age in hours is correlated to the total serum bilirubin and where it should be. And we're gonna take the total serum bilirubin, especially in those babies that we have a slight concern, and we're gonna attach it to this graph to make a determination about whether or not we're concerned or not concerned. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, jaundice and the different types of jaundice a little bit later on because they do they don't show up immediately after birth they show up about 24 hours or further if something is if the baby is born jaundice we're going to be concerned about a more pathological problem that is is there for that baby but for the most part the jaundice shows up 24 hours or past So when we're talking about the integumentary system, we have a lot of normals that occur that are abnormal. <laughs> so um, we're gonna look at some pictures here. So we have vernix. So vernix is that white cheesy stuff that the babies are born with. And the babies who are a little bit preterm or early, um, early term and late preterm babies who are born, we're gonna see a lot of vernix on them because it kind of, it starts to disintegrate the further in gestation that the baby gets. This is great protectant for the baby's skin and a lot of hospitals have actually established policies to where we don't wash it off at all anymore, which I think is great because it's really, um, it's very protective for the baby. It also has antimicrobial properties associated with it. So it's, it's very good for the baby to have that vernix on their skin and for us to rub it in instead of washing it off. And here we have two different pictures. If you look at the baby on the left here, this kind of shows some acrocyanosis. So you can see that the arms, this is a little bit severe, but it showed it so well. So you can see that the arms here are a little bit, um, bluish as are the feet and kind of the legs to where the face, the mouth, the lips, the chest are all nice and pink. So that's a classic example of our acrocyanosis, which again is where the hands and the feet, a little bit the extremities and, um, are going to be a little bit bluer and grayish and that's okay. It's totally normal. And parents ask about it a lot. So it's a good education piece to have. This is a great um, picture here on, on the right of a Mongolian spot. So now what do you think that Mongolian spot looks like? A bruise, right? So we need to be educating our parents on Mongolian spots if we notice them on the babies. It's really important that we point them out and say, hey, look, your baby has this, this spot here. It's called a Mongolian spot. It's very common and it's normal. And no, we did not hurt your baby. And no, you did not hurt your baby. 
it's a normal birth um, birthmark. It does fade over time, and it is it's more common in um, Asian and Hispanic babies than um, any other any other babies. So the the Mongolian spot again, it's a key piece of education so that the parents know that it's their one, two that it will fade, and three that nobody did anything to bruise their baby because that is exactly what it looks like. When we're talking about sweat glands for baby, their sweat glands are active at about 24 hours after life. And one thing to consider with the sweat glands is what is called baby acne. It's normal, and it typically appears around that same time, that 24 hours, a little bit past 24 hours of life, and that's the activation of the sweat glands. And it, um, it can appear all over the body. It's very typical on the face and the cheeks, um, and it's just, it looks like little pimples. We want to make sure that parents know when they're not pimples, and two, not to pop them, <laughs> because it will cause scarring for the baby. And they'll go away within, it takes about a week, usually, for the body to regulate those sweat glands and to have that milia go away. Um, the other aspect that we're looking at here is the, um, the one I'm not going to be able to say, desquamation, which is peeling of the baby's skin. So the desquamation is very, um, it's very normal. We will see full-term infants or post-term babies specifically. So if a baby's born at 41 weeks or even 42 weeks, we're definitely going to see the peeling of the baby's skin. If the baby's born and there's not already peeling, there will be within a few weeks. So we're going to educate our parents about the peeling of the skin. And then we have the nevi, which is also referred to um, as a stork bite. So this is a very common location for the stork bite, which is the reddening of, of the skin. It can occur on the face as well, um, or the back of the neck. Typically, the, the reddening that occurs on the face will fade by the age of two but the stuff, the reddening that occurs on the back of the neck typically doesn't fade. You might have one yourself, you might have um, a loved one who you can lift up their hair in the back and see, see that stork bite. There's nothing to do for them, there's nothing that, um, that they, there's no complications that they cause, they're just there. <laughs> The other thing we want to talk about is the, um, the erythemia toxium, and that is the newborn rash. Also very common, occurs in most newborns, usually pops up around 48 to 72 hours, and it's just a profuse rash. Um, it, it won't occur on the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet, um, and it's, it doesn't transfer to the face quite as often, but it's definitely on the trunk in the extremities. Um, it does not harm the newborn. It's nothing that the newborn needs to be seen for. It's pretty much just their skin adjusting to extra uterine life. Some problems that we would see would be anything that appears to be an infection. Um, if we have any any open lesions, so we could potentially have a birth injury, um, then those are all things we're going to want to watch a little bit closer. When we're looking at the reproductive system, which we're going to assess on all of our newborns, we are expecting to see, especially in the female genitalia, a little bit of swelling. So all of those hormones that mom has are also circulating through baby's body. So we can see a little bit of swelling, we could see a little bit of discharge, um, and then the genitalia is going to be um, larger or smaller based off of the gestational age of the baby. So we just wanna take a look, we wanna make sure that the genitalia is not ambiguous, that it's there, we can tell what it is. Um, and then also that it's, um, it's intact. So again, those females are gonna have swelling. They might have a little bit of swollen breast tissue as well. And then we might see some discharge from the vagina. For the males, sometimes we do see uh, swelling of the scrotum, but the males, we want to make sure that we have a testes that we can palpate on each side and that they're not 
um, ascended into, into the abdomen. So we're going to take a look at those. We can see ambiguous genitalia. So we want, we'll, that typically leads to genetic testing to determine whether genetically the baby is male or female. And then there's a lot of counseling that goes into that with the parents to go on from there. Here's a nice picture of um, normal appearing genitalia. It's interesting that they made that baby's cord blue. I think it um, is probably something to assist in the drying of the cord, but. As for the neuromuscular system, the newborn is born with a lot of great reflexes. And if you look in your book in table 22.4, it's on page 546, you're going to see all of the reflexes played out very nicely there. Um, some of the most common ones are the moral reflex, which is the startle where the baby startles essentially with their arms um, when there's any sort of loud noise or startling touch. One of the reflexes that's interesting for newborns is the Babinski, because the Babinski for the newborn, the toes flail when you do the Babinski reflex on the toes. And for the adult, the toes should crunch, right? So the newborn, we're going to flail. Now, if we saw flail toes on an adult when we did a Babinski, we would note that as abnormal and we would suspect some sort of neurological deficit. But for newborns, the expected response is the, is the flailed toes. The other thing that's kind of fun is to do the stepping reflex. So if you hold a baby up and lightly touch their feet to the ground, they will do a stepping motion. Another key reflex that the baby has is the sucking reflex. So they can suck and swallow in that gag reflex. And it's uncomfortable, but we do have to assess that gag reflex on those newborns to make sure that it's there. And the suck swallow is obviously incredibly important so those newborns can survive. When we're looking at the skeletal system, a lot of what we're concerned about has to do with the head. And so we're going to look at the way the baby's head molds. And as you know, we have the plates in the school aren't fused in newborn babies. And the reason is because that baby has to fit through the birth canal. And it would not fit through if that head did not mold a little bit. So you can see the direction that these plates move um, when they are, um, when that baby's coming through. And this is a classic example of a cone head. I always joke that we don't put hats on babies to keep them warm because there's no research that supports that. Um, but we put hats on babies to cover up their misshapen heads for the parents so that they don't, they don't think their baby looks so funny because this is a very elongated head. <laughs> Then we start talking about our various swellings and our, um, our caput versus our um, hematomas. So as you can see in A here, we're looking at the swelling. And this occurs when the baby is in the birth canal for a long time. We get a lot of swelling. And this is the other cause of a cone head, if you will. Now you can see that this crosses these lines, right? So here's your suture line right here, and the, the caput crosses the suture lines. This right here does not cross the suture line, right? So when we're looking at the cephalohematoma, we are, um, we are not crossing our suture lines. And that can, um, that can be a serious thing for a couple different reasons. One being that there was a significant injury if we're seeing that. Two, it can cause pressure in the brain. And three, we're gonna have all this extra broken down red blood cells that now this baby's gonna have to excrete. So that can be a problem. The subglial hemorrhage is more severe than a cephalohematoma, and you can see that this one also is going to cross those suture lines. Now, we, um, we can differentiate these two by the feel of them and by the look. So this is going to have more of a, um, a bruised appearance to it, and it's going to be firmer to the touch and warmer to the touch, whereas the caput is just edema. So it's very squishy, um, and it's not as it's not hot because if there's not blood right there, it's just edema. 
we're going to watch these things essentially and make sure that there's not pressure on the brain. If any, if we get an increase in um, intracranial pressure due to either of these, then we'll start to drain them. But uh, the first step, the first intervention is just to watch it. So one of the things we're looking at here is um, potential for hip dysplasia or um, a dis dislocation of the hip. So you can see we look at a couple different things. One, we can look at the, um, actually the, um, oh my gosh, what are they called? The rolls, <laughs> the rolls that the baby has. So we're gonna look at the rolls and make sure that they line up. If they don't line up, we might have um, a, a hip that's out of place. So you can see here, we have some rolls and on this side we don't. You see this leg's a little bit shorter than this leg. The other thing we're gonna do is rotate the hips and feel for any sort of click. We can put the legs up like this and you see how this, foot is faced out and this foot is faced forward. So all of these are aspects that we can do to determine whether or not those hips are in place. When we're doing the hips, we're also gonna flip the baby over and take a look at the spine, make sure the spinal column is straight, that there's no lesions or um, masses. And then we're gonna look at the point where the spinal column kind of meets the buttocks right there. And it's right above the, the crease of the buttocks. We're gonna take a look there and make sure that there's no dimple or hair tuft. There could be an opening. There could be just a dimple with a hair tuft. There could be just a severe dimple. All of those things we're gonna to wanna to report to our pediatrician pretty quickly um, because they could be an indication of a spina bifida. And spina bifida occurs in, in various um, severities. And so it could be that it just didn't close fully in which case we would have the, um, that we would see kind of an opening or we would see a dimple and potentially a hair tuft growing on the dimple there. There's not much we can do about the spina bifida immediately and they, um, as nurse, in the nursing role. So what we're going to do is we're going to report it to the pediatrician. They'll do an ultrasound to determine how severe it is and they'll go from there. Sometimes they do surgery, sometimes they don't, sometimes it's watched, um, and then they do surgery. So it just totally depends on what they see. We're gonna move on to the behavioral characteristics of these newborn babies. So newborns have sleep cycles and wake cycles just like they did in utero. And they're gonna be up at certain times and um, asleep during certain times. It doesn't always correlate to the way they were in utero. A lot of moms are concerned that, well, this baby's up all night um, when I'm pregnant, so now I'm gonna be up all night with a newborn. And it doesn't always correlate. And they can, um, they can quickly retrain a baby for sleeping by uh, when they feed the baby. So we wanna educate our parents that they need to be feeding the baby at least every two hours. The baby can go for one four hour stretch, but we really want that baby eating at least every two hours, especially after the first 24 hours of life. The first 24 hours of life, kind of anything goes with the feeding, unless there's something that we're worried about feeding wise. After that, they wanna be feeding that infant every two hours and then with that one four hour stretch. So if they wake the baby up and feed the baby and then let that baby sleep longer at night, then if they wake the baby up every two hours throughout the day, then they can let that baby have that longer stretch of sleep throughout the night. So it's fairly easy to retrain those babies whose temperament allows for retraining because that's key. We're also gonna take a look at the gestational age because that's gonna have an impact on how that baby behaves. Just um, earlier gestational age babies aren't gonna be as active as later gestational age babies. The time, the stimuli and the medication are all um, environmental factors or not necessarily environmental, but they're all factors that can influence the behavior of the baby. The witching hour is a real thing. Babies are um, typically fussier in between five and seven o'clock at night, and it's because they've had a long day. They're kind of done with the stimuli around them, and they're ready to move on to sleep. So uh, being cognizant of that and educating our parents on that is really important. 
there's a variety of different medications that do have an influence on the behavior of the baby, but most newborns aren't receiving medications. So this isn't something that we're overly concerned about unless we have a very specific case of a newborn taking a specific medication. So here's all of our different behavioral states. So we have, we have sleeping, we have active awake, we have these crying babies, we have tired babies. <laughs> You can just see there's a lot of different states that that newborn can be in. So from a sensory perspective, babies are born uh, without the ability to differentiate colors. So they really like black and white and high contrast um, <clears throat> patterns because they can differentiate the contrast. They just can't see the actual color. Yellow is actually the first color that newborns can see. It's usually about two to three months that they start being able to see color. They also can't see that far away. So the distance from mom's, from baby's face when he or she is nursing to mom's face is about as far as they can see clearly. That's a great, um, a great adaptation that the babies have is they can see their mom, which of course helps with bonding and it helps with um, the promotion of the bonding from mom to baby, not just baby to mom, but because the baby will respond to seeing mom's face and that way mom knows that the baby is, um, it can see her and it shows, it gives the, the mom a bonding to the baby as well. And it slowly increases to where they can see more and more. But for those first couple of weeks, the baby can just see this distance here clearly. The babies can hear. Hearing, hearing is fully developed in utero. And so that's why we do the newborn hearing screen as well, because we can determine early on whether we're going to have potential hearing problems. And it's comforting to babies to hear the sounds that they heard in utero. So if you can imagine being very close to somebody's heart and digestion and being in water, everything's going to be kind of muffled. You're going to hear big swooshing sounds. So a lot of the times babies want to be back in that muffled environment and they can be comforted by doing a shh because that's the sound they heard for nine months of their lives and that was what they were comforted by in utero. Also mom's heart beats so sometimes you can get parents by a bear that has like a heartbeat that goes along with it or um, there's sound machines that have waves crashing they have the shushing sound they have the heartbeat these all just help baby to transition into that extra uterine life babies are also born with a, um, a highly developed sense of smell so they can actually smell it's almost fully developed to get that by about 28 weeks so even those early preterm babies, those micropemies, they can typically smell, which is kind of cool. That sense also helps them with survival. Um, there's a fabulous video out there on the web. You can probably search it and find it of the baby doing the newborn crawl. And that is initiated by the sense of smell. The baby can smell the colostrum. So the baby is placed on mom's abdomen and a little bit of colostrum is um, excreted and the baby will make its way up and latch onto that breast because it smells the colostrum, which is kind of cool. Babies have um, their sense of taste is developed as well, and they prefer sweet. And that can actually be used uh, for pain control. So we have these fabulous little pacifiers that are soaked in sucrose. They're called sweeties. And so when we're doing a procedure on a baby that could potentially be painful, that can be a higher level of pain control than um, say an analgesic that we would potentially administer. Of course, it depends on the level of procedure that we're doing, but it's something for those slightly discomforting or um, slightly uncomfortable procedures that might cause a low level of pain. The sweeties work amazing and that sucking, the sucking motion along with the sugar actually releases opioids into the bloodstream. So it's, it provides a great level of pain control. Um, and as for touch, babies can have great sensory for touch. They are more sensitive on their face and on their hands and the palms of their feet. When you think about it, the baby's face is where it's going to be um, 
doing a lot of its activity, right? That's where it's suckling, that's where um, it feels the, the, the breast and will root towards it. So that heightened level of touch on the face and the hands is important too. The hands will grasp for things, it will feel mom, it will feel dad, um, and will will show you the parents that the baby is there and the baby can, can feel various things to um, interpret its environment as well. So you mentioned the baby's temperament. Every, every baby is born with a certain type of temperament and temperament doesn't really change. Um, we can change some behaviors, but the temperament itself doesn't change. That temperament is gonna define how that baby responds to its environmental stimuli. If you have a baby who's highly sensitive, they're gonna have a really tough time with loud noises, with changes in their environment and things of that nature. Whereas if you have just an easy peasy, easy going baby, they're gonna be okay. Okay, so we want to um, consider temperament when we are doing our interventions and we can tell pretty early on what the temperament of a baby is. The habituation refers to the baby's ability to um, integrate itself essentially into the environment. Um, it's, it has it's gonna just learn what the environment that they are part of um, and they're gonna be able to um, to be a part of that environment so su successfully. The consolability is gonna be different for every baby. Some babies are gonna cry and not be consoled, and some babies, all you have to do is pat them on the butt and they're good to go. So um, we wanna let parents know that there's a wide variety of different levels of consolability, and just because the baby doesn't consult easy doesn't mean that the parent's doing something wrong. It might just be that this baby takes a little bit more time and comfort to be consoled. The cuddliness of the baby is going to have an impact on the parents directly. So the cuddliness, if a baby is um, cuddles right into mom and dad, those parents are going to have a much easier time bonding to that baby. If the baby is constantly pushing itself away and crying and becoming rigid every time it picks the baby gets picked up those parents are going to have a more difficult time bonding to that baby as makes perfect sense right do you want to go up and give somebody a hug that you know is just going to push you away no so it's the same thing that and when we notice babies who don't seem like they want to be held we just want to let the parents know that it's not their parenting it's not them it's just the baby doesn't want to be held which might seem like um, common sense but when it's your newborn baby who's pushing you away that can feel very um, parents can feel very rejected by their newborns and we just want to make sure that they understand that every baby's a little bit different and every baby's needs are a little bit different and maybe this baby just needs some physical space we're going to see a lack of cuddliness in babies who are withdrawing from um, various drugs so we're going to do an abstinence score on these babies and we'll notice that these babies just don't really want to be held they're their neurological state is so heightened that they don't want any additional stimuli. When we're looking at irritability, that kind of goes back to the temperament of the baby as does crying. Some babies are just more irritable than others, and some babies cry is really soft and quiet, and some babies are really loud. I remember when my first was a newborn, a good friend of mine had a baby right around the same time and we were in the car and uh, we had both babies in the car with us and my friend said oh my gosh Isabella's crying so much and I like, thinking to myself that's her cry wow you're pretty lucky my kid would you'd pull over the car if my kid started crying right now because her cry was so loud and abrasive I could barely hear myself think when she was crying whereas this baby's cry was like wah, wah, wah. And that was, that was her cry. So every baby has a little bit of a different way of communicating. And crying is their way of communicating. That's another point that we really want to educate our parents on, is that just because the baby's crying doesn't necessarily mean that there's something that's wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean that the baby's uncomfortable. It could be that the baby wants to eat. It could be that the baby needs their diaper changed. It could be that the baby's hot or the baby's cold or something's irritating them. 
It could just be that they have something to say and they have no other way to say it. Um, so we want to be aware of our baby's cries and make sure that when the baby's crying, we are checking on those needs, such as, does the baby need to eat? Do we need a fresh diaper? Is the baby in an uncomfortable position? Is there something pushing on the baby that would be uncomfortable for the baby? If the baby's in the car seat, is the strap too tight? If the baby's laying in the house, is it cold? Is it hot? We want, definitely want to take a look at those things because it is the baby's way of communicating. And if we look at everything and this kid's fine and perfectly good, then it might just be baby has something to say and has no other way to say it. Okay, so we are looking at our nursing interventions and our nursing care management. We are we break it up into three different sections. So this is for hospital-based nursing of the postpartum baby, postpartum newborn. We're looking at birth to two hours, two hours to discharge, and then what our discharge planning and discharge teaching is for this family to go home with. So birth to two hours. When the baby is first born, baby's going to come from mom and go onto mom's chest. We're looking to make sure that baby is breathing. Um, if the baby's breathing and crying and vigorous, that baby has a heart rate. Okay, and the way that we are able to effectively communicate this to our team and to, um, to those looking back is by using the APGAR scoring system. Now, although APGAR does um, go out, does become a very nice acronym, it's actually the woman, it was Virginia APGAR who developed this system. So her, her last name was APGAR, um, and it's just nice that it turns into an acronym that we can utilize to remember what it is that we're assessing. Now, you will never see a nurse say, stop, I'm doing an APGAR. It's not that used in that manner. If we don't stop and do a set of APGAR on the baby, what we do is we observe the baby at one minute of life and at five minutes of life. And we go back and um, retrospectively score the baby based off of, off of these indicators. So we're gonna look at the activity, which is also the muscle tone of the baby, the pulse, the grimace, which is the reflex, the reflex activity, um, and the appearance or the skin color, and the respirations. So pretty much, if we have a baby who comes out and is screaming, we're gonna get two points for activity, because if they're screaming, they're moving all around, we're going to get two points for pulse because no baby who's screaming has a pulse less than 100. We're going to get two points for grimace because that baby's making a grimace with its face when it's screaming. Um, we're, we might get zero, one, or two points for color because I, we never know what color the skin's going to come out. I think I've only given two points for color once in my entire life um, because the baby almost always has blue extremities, especially at one in five minutes of life. Um, but again, if that baby comes out crying, we have two points for respiration. So in a healthy, normal birth, our typical APGARs are eight at one minute and nine at five minutes. And that's because babies are born blue most of the time. Um, and it takes a little bit for them to, to pink up. So we typically have eight nine APGARs or nine nine APGARs. And that indicates a healthy baby. If we have an APGAR, um, in every institution is a little bit different. At Kaiser, if it's seven or less at five minutes, then we do a 10 minute APGAR and we can go all the way out to 30 minutes. We start doing them in increments of 10 minutes. So we can have a one minute, a five minute, a 10 minute, a 20 minute, a 30 minute APGAR. If we're going all the way out to 30 minutes, we're gonna have a severely depressed baby. The APGAR helps give us a clue as to whether or not that baby, that it, newborn had some sort of event in utero and also whether or not that newborn is going to be acidotic. So this is our neonatal resuscitation algorithm and we'll it's just a quick way 
to look at what we're doing for the baby when the baby is not born nice and vigorous. One thing that I want you to know, I don't expect you to have this memorized. It's just good to know that there is a standardized algorithm that is utilized. And if you go do um, your NRP, neonatal resuscitation program, if you become certified in that, this is what we utilize. Um, and again, remember how we talked about the cardiac versus the respiratory event, that when babies code, it's almost always respiratory related, whereas when adults code, it's almost always cardiac related. So as you can see here, what we're doing is PPV, and that's our intervention. Very rarely do we have to get to doing compressions, and we're going to do PPP, sorry, PPV up until the first minute of life before we even start compressions. So even if that heart rate is below 60, we're not going to start compressions until we've done 30 or so seconds of PPV because that's probably what the problem is. And once we give that those respirations, that baby's heart rate is gonna come right back up. So another interesting thing is here. So this is our targeted, see, pre-ductal SpO2 after birth. So you can see at one minute, we only expect that kid to be about 60% oxygenated. So we don't need to be utilizing 100% oxygen on babies who are adequately perfusing. So if that heart rate's above 60, we're gonna leave our oxygen at 21%, and we're not gonna up it unless we have to start doing compressions. At that point, we would run it up to 100 because then there's a little bit more going on. But usually all that needs to happen is those alveoli, which are flat, need to pop open so that they can start doing their gas exchange. So you can see around 10 minutes of life is when we expect that newborn to be a little bit more oxygenated. So it's, there's a progression here. Some of the things that we're gonna do as nurses in the first two hours of life is a physical assessment. We do a head to toe. We're gonna to do um, vital signs and we're gonna look at the size of the baby. The size of the baby is important because it determines whether or not we do a blood sugar on the baby. So babies who are large for gestational age or small for gestational age, we're gonna do blood sugars on. And the reason being is because those LGA babies, the large for gestational age, those babies are going to be utilizing more blood glucose um, because they're larger and so they have more to utilize. And the small for gestational age babies, the idea behind that one is that they might not have the glucose stores available to them. So we want to make sure that they are, um, they have adequate glucose levels because that's what feeds the brain and we want to make sure that brain function is adequate. Here is um, the growth curve. So you can see we would just plot the baby on this curve. Now we have fabulous computer programs that do this for us, so we don't have to sit there with, um, with a pencil and actually plot it out, but we'll be told um, where, it, where the baby falls. And some hospitals have it for it's strictly if it's LGA or um, SGA, then we do blood sugars. Some are, nope, at 4,000 grams, we do blood sugars, or at um, 2,500 grams, we do blood sugar, below 2,500 or above 4,000, or below 2,000, above 4,000. So it just depends on the hospital um, that you work at as to how you determine whether or not you do blood sugars. We'd like our babies all to fall within the appropriate for gestational age, though. So we're going to have some extra. Um, not interventions, but observation that occurs with our early term infants, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, our early term infants and our late preterm infants. So our early term infants are those from 37 weeks to just prior to 39 weeks, so 38 and 6. And they just sometimes they have a little bit of a tougher time transitioning. Our late preterm babies can potentially stay with moms, so we do get a good number of 34-weekers, especially if they receive that beta-methasone to help with that lung maturity. We'll get some 34-weekers that get to stay with mom in, in the hospital or in the hospital room. And when that occurs, we're going to be 
closely watching those babies because they are at an increase for respiratory distress, um, temperature instability. They're going to have a tough time feeding because their mouths are so small and that suck swallow reflux isn't fully developed potentially. And for the hyperbilirubinemia. The hyperbilirubinemia. We are watching the airway. That's our primary concern, maintaining that baby's skin temperature. And we're gonna do some skin to skin. That skin to skin, we want to start as soon as possible after birth. Hopefully the baby has gone directly skin to skin with mom. If that's not the case, then we will um, get that baby skin to skin as soon as possible. The skin to skin is the best initiation of breastfeeding. So we want to start that as quickly as we possibly can. The other thing we're going to look at is we're going to do a head to toe and a ballard. So I already mentioned the head to toe physical assessment and that's just touching and feeling and looking at the newborn all along the way to make sure we don't see the dimple at the sacrum, that we um, have our sutures aren't fully approximated, that there's um, the, the fontanelle is soft, that we our spinal column is straight and intact, that we don't have those hip clicks, that we um, have five fingers and five toes and no more and no less, and that the genitalia is the way it's supposed to be and is intact. So we're going to take a look at all of that. Um, and then the Ballard score I'm going to show you here in just a second. But as for the newborn medications, we give both the erythromycin and the ice, which here's an example of that and the vitamin K, which is a shot. And that vitamin K is um, the precursor to the clotting factors that the immature liver isn't making. So that's why we give the vitamin K so that those clotting factors can get started and we can have, um, like babies can effectively clot their bud, blood. The erythromycin is given prophylactically to prevent an eye infection for some potential, from some potential STDs. So here's the Ballard score. So the purpose of the Ballard score is that we will um, determine the neuromuscular maturity and physical maturity by doing these various tests on the baby. And that will tell us the maturity rating in weeks. So it should, it should line up with the baby's gestational age. If it doesn't, then it's something we're going to want to pass on to the pediatrician because they might want to do some additional testing of the neurological uh, maturity of the baby. Okay, sorry about that, back to it. So the other um, thing that we're gonna look at is some common problems for the newborn. So some of, one of the physiological problems that we can run across is jaundice. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. So physiological jaundice and breastfeeding jaundice um, and even most pathological jaundices occur 24 hours and past from birth. If the baby is born in this jaundice, then that's definitely pathological and something that we're gonna um, probably call the NICU and have the baby admitted to the NICU for because there's something serious going on if there's jaundice present before 24 hours past um, after birth. So with jaundice, we can see yellowing of the sclera of the eyes, yellowing of the face, yellowing of the trunk. And then we're going to be looking at our total serum bilirubin. And when we take a look at that, um, if you remember that the curve that we looked at, those numbers are going to indicate whether we're at a high risk or a low risk for hyperbilirubinemia. And if we're at a high risk, we're going to give the baby phototherapy. So you can see right here, this is a preemie here, but you get the idea with the blue lights. And here's what we use to protect the baby's eyes because the phototherapy is using those UV rays for to excrete the bilirubin um, because it's broken down by the UV rays. 
there's exchange transfusions that can also occur in significant cases. The, the jaundice, if left untreated and if severe, can lead to all sorts of complications, including brain damage. So it's something that we're going to keep a close eye on. Our, our RH negative moms, um, their babies have a higher risk of jaundice. Um, because the maternal blood cells are attacking the fetal blood cells and because of the Rh negative versus the Rh positive if the baby is Rh positive. So we're, um, we're going to keep a closer eyes, eyes on the, those babies and that's why we do um, the Coombs test and do the, the cord blood. We do some additional testing on moms who have Rh negative or who are O positive because those babies are also at an increased risk for jaundice. Hypoglycemia and um, hypocalcemia are both problems that are commonly seen as well. Hypoglycemia is very common. It's a scene, especially in our bigger babies and our little babies. We go back to that growth curve, remember, that we talked about with the LGA and the SGA, so small for gestational age, SGA, or large for gestational age, LGA. So those babies are at risk for hypoglycemia. Remember, the brain functions off of glucose, especially in those early days. So we want to make sure that the baby has adequate glucose stores. So we're going to keep a close eye on those. Some of the signs that we're going to look for is jitteriness. So if the baby's jittery, that's a sign of hypoglycemia. If the baby's tachypnic, that's a sign. And if the baby's cold, then we're also going to be concerned because if you remember back to that cold stress algorithm, when the baby uses up, um, burns a lot of that brown fat or tries to keep itself warm, it's going to use up a lot of glucose as well. The hypocalcemia, um, it's not as common as the hypoglycemia, but it's just something that we're going to be aware of and keep an eye out for. Birth injuries can range anywhere from um, just some bruising on the face. So if a baby's born really fast, so the mom has really fast labor, baby comes down fast, it quite literally slams into a lot of things along the way. So the face can end up bruised. Um, and also if a baby is crowning for a long time, we might see a bruised face. Um, or there can be birth injuries all the way up to cerebral palsy with lasting effects. So if there's a shoulder dystocia, we can expect some sort of brachial plexus injury. If um, the baby has a is born with a vacuum or born via uh, forceps, then we might see some soft tissue injuries. Sometimes we can see injuries due from a C-section. So a lot of babies um, end up getting stuck in a C-section as well. And we might see lacerations from the scalpel. We might see lacerations from either the forceps or the, um, the vacuum if those are used as well. So there's a variety of different tests that we are going to do. You can see the pictures here are actually of the newborn hearing screen. So we do that to, we test the babies with a really small, quiet noise, and we just test their brain waves to see if they actually hear the noise. Um, this is a good preliminary test to determine if there's going to be, or if there is any sort of hearing deficit, because the earlier we catch that and the earlier we intervene, the better the outcomes are. There's the universal, un sorry, universal newborn screening, um, genetic diseases, and inborn errors for metabolism. All of those are done with what you will hear in the hospital referred to as the PKU test. And that PKU test, why it's called that is because that's what it originally tested was for an intolerance to PKU. And when babies have an intolerance, in it's a metabolic intolerance, they're unable to process the mother's breast milk, and so they become very sick very quick. Every couple years, there's a couple more tests that are added to this. It was actually part of a delivery for a woman twice, um, and it was kind of funny because each time I was also very, very pregnant. I think with her first, I, it was one of my last shifts and I was like 38 weeks and she was 39 weeks in delivering. And with the second time I helped her, it was, it was a very similar situation. I was incredibly pregnant as was she obviously, cause she was having a baby. 
and she had a baby die of what of a metabolic disorder because it was about a week of life and the baby got really sick and they didn't know what was wrong with the baby the, there was no infection or anything um but it was the baby's body rejecting the food that it was given because it was unable to break it down and it became so toxic to the newborn that the baby became so sick that she actually died um so the that metabolic test had been added to this the universal newborn screening that's done and um so it was kind of an interesting case to be a part of and we had to do special testing on both babies the first baby was not did not have the metabolic one but the second one i was a part of did actually have that metabolic disorder so we want to um, those tests they can be a little bit traumatic because it does look like a lot of blood it's not a ton of blood it's a hill prick that's done and it's usually done close to discharge but it's something that's really important uh, for for the babies to just make sure that there's no metabolic disorder present that might cause a devastating illness for that newborn and the critical congenital heart disease so this was added probably um, I want to say about eight years ago. And what happens is we take a preductal and a postductal SPO2 and compare them and just make sure that there's not too much of a difference between them so that we can determine that the baby is being adequately oxygenated. And with that, that allows us to know that there's not significant congenital heart defects. So it's a really great test. It's really simple. We just do literally do an O2 sat um, on the right wrist and one on the left foot and it works out great. Um, so it's a simple non-invasive test that gives us a good indication if there's an immediate life-threatening cardiac defect. And this has reduced the mortality rate for that significantly because those are being caught early and um, being treated really early. So from collecting the specimen, you can see here that in this picture here, they're warming the baby's foot because we want all of that really rich oxygenated blood down to the baby's foot. We wanna make sure that anytime we do a blood glucose too, that we're warming the foot so that we have, um, so that we're able to adequately pull out that good blood that's well oxygenated and has all the glucose because otherwise we might get a false low reading. This picture here shows us where we should poke. <laughs> so we don't want to poke too much central in um, the heel because you can see there's some arteries and nerves that are in that area. So we're really going to want to use um, these lateral surfaces here. So usually where this sh is shaded here, um, those are going to be the meatiest and give you the best return. And then for newborns that need a significant blood draw, so if we have a, a suspected infection, then uh, we'll call phlebotomy to come and, and actually use a tiny little needle. And they, you typically need to use a syringe to, to draw that blood. So some of the interventions that we're going to, um, nursing interventions that we're going to it put in place for these newborns is we want them to have a protective environment. So this picture here is showing a hugs tag and a kisses tag. So most facilities use the hugs tag. Um, most facilities don't use this aspect of it, but maybe they will in the future, I'm not sure. Uh, what this does is the facility is then able to establish perimeters to where the hugs tag is allowed to be and isn't allowed to be, and it just sets off a big, huge, loud alarm if that hugs tag passes that perimeter. So then it alerts us as to um, the fact that a baby is being potentially abducted. It also tells us where that baby is. So we sometimes we'll tell our our patients, it's kind of like a baby low jack with that on. It is activated if it's cut off. It's activated if it goes outside of the area, it's activated if it falls off. So uh, that's something we're gonna talk to the parents about. We're also gonna be checking under to ensure the integrity of the skin underneath that tag, since it is something that's pushing up against the skin of the newborn. We're also um, going to make sure that the family is well aware of the fact that this newborn does not have any sort of um, 
great immunity so that we want everybody to wash their hands. We're going to give them lots of hand sanitizer, tell them to be very cognizant of who they're allowing in their home when they go home so that this baby isn't exposed to too much because they don't have that much immunity. So some of the um, therapeutic and surgical procedures that could potentially be done in the hospital, definitely immunization. So parents are offered the hepatitis B shot before they leave the hospital. Some hospitals do it in the newborn period, that first two hours, um, with the vitamin K just in the opposite leg. So the vitamin K is done in the left, left, left thigh and the, um, the hepatitis B would be done in the right thigh. But most places are still doing the hepatitis B upon discharge. So uh, that's the way most facilities do the immunization. It's not something that has to be done. It's just offered to parents at that point if they want it. The circumcision is typically not done in the hospital anymore. At Kaiser, it's kind of funny because we have a room called a circumcision room and literally no circumcision has ever taken place in that room. There's a nice big plaque though that says circumcision room. Um, so the tides are kind of changing on that. It used to be about 25% um, did not circumcise and 75% did, and now it's kind of switched. It's about 60-40. 60% do not circumcise and 40% do. So uh, um, physicians have started doing it in the office at the two-day visit. Physicians will not circumcise a baby who has not received their vitamin K injection. So that's an education point to parents who have a baby boy. If they want him circumcised, they will need to get that vitamin K shot. There's some um, Lovely pictures coming here, so just beware. And real quick though, here's some, a picture of where we're gonna shoot for for that injection, the vastus lateralis muscle of the newborn, and you can see right here of where the nurse is giving that injection. So here, here's a baby swaddled and prepared for a circumcision. This here, here I'll move myself out of the way here. This here is the circumcision process. So this is one um, tool. There's a variety of different tools that can be utilized, but this is one. Um, and this is post-circumcision, and here is a nicely healed circumcision. So how do we deal with the ne newborn and neonatal pain? And how do we determine whether they're in pain to begin with? They can't tell us if their pain is a three out of 10, right? So we look at their, their sorry, excuse me. <coughs> we look at their physiology and we look at how they're behaving. There's a variety of different pain scales that we can use. Um, one is called the NIPS pain scale. One is, um, is um, and pass. So whatever the facility you're at, it pops up. And most of the time it's asking, is this baby screaming and crying? Is this baby clenched up in a ball or is this baby relaxed? Do we have a change in heart rate and breathing and things of that nature. So we're looking at the baby, we're looking at the state of that newborn um, or neonate to determine whether or not they're in pain. The best treatment, again, is those sweeties. So the sucking along with the sucrose is going to produce um, some endorphins and, and that opioid response to, to prevent the pain from reaching from, or the newborn from experiencing the pain. We can definitely do analgesia and um, anesthetic on newborns when if we're going to do something more invasive like surgery, we would put the baby under anesthesia, but for simple procedures such as the circumcision, even a spinal tap, the sweetie is a better way to go just because it avoids those additional pokes because we would use a local anesthetic there and that sweetie is almost as effective, if not even more effective. When we're um, talking to our family, we want to promote the bonding for that the family is having with this newborn infant. They're going to take this baby home, obviously, and they're going to um, make it a part of their family. So we want the parents to be involved. Remember, these patients are healthy 
patients. They are going through a normal process. So we don't need to do everything for them. We want it to encourage mom to get up and move as soon as possible. We want to encourage dad to come change this baby's diaper, put the first diaper on the baby, um, bathe the baby themselves, do these things themselves, because it really helps promote that independence that they're going to need when they go home, especially those first-time parents. If it's not their first baby, then it's a little bit different. Um, we're still going to promote all of that, but it isn't quite as um, I guess important to to push them to do those things because they've they've done them hopefully successfully once before, at least once before. But those first time parents are going to want to involve in every aspect of that newborn care. So sometimes dad feels like he can't come over to the warmer when we're doing um, the head to toe or the injections. And we're going to want to bring dad over. Hey dad, come hold your baby's hand while I do this. Go wash your hands first. We'll wait for you. And we want to make it really um, involve the family in everything that we're doing. And we're going to be watching. We want to see, do we need to put a social work consult in for this family for whatever reason it might be? Is mom seem completely detached? Is, are mom and dad not talking at all? Is dad not wanting anything to do with the baby? And it not, it's not just first time dad. I'm scared to touch this thing because I might break it. Is it just like he's annoyed and sitting in the corner on his phone the whole time? So we want to make those assessments and potentially put in a work, a social work consult if needed so that the social workers can get involved and provide them with resources to help them through this, this transition. Um, overstimulating the infant is definitely gonna cause a fussy baby and we're gonna um, set mom and dad up to feel like they can't settle their baby. So we wanna make sure we're clustering our care as much as possible and we're keeping it quiet in the rooms. We wanna encourage them that they don't have too many visitors. Um, a few in a short period of time and then send everybody home. And we can uh, talk to mom and dad about that when they, um, they're laboring and then kind of reiterate it in postpartum to make sure that we're giving them the time and the quiet time they need and that that baby is having some quiet time. This baby is it's being affronted with a whole new world. We want to make sure it's a nice smooth transition for the newborn. So discharge planning is going to be significantly education heavy. What we're doing here is educating, educating, educating. We're talking to them about bathing the baby when they go home. We're talking to them about the cold stress. We're talking to them about feeding the baby, about recording the poops and peas, about keeping an eye out for a fever, for dehydration, for all these things. So it's educate, educate, educate. And we're also going to send them home with a pack about this thick of a whole bunch of information for them and the numbers that they need to call if they have concerns. Um, and this last little picture here, this is a, a um, preterm baby and this is a car seat challenge test. So sometimes our little preemies in different institutions have a different week associated with it, but standard is about 36 weeks or less. So if they're 36 weeks or less, um, we're gonna do a car seat challenge test for them before they go home. And what that does is just make sure that the way their car seat is situated doesn't cause them to cut off their breathing. <laughs> So we want the baby to keep breathing on its drive home. So we're going to make sure that as it's situated in that car seat, it's able to maintain its O2 sets. We have positioning devices and whatnot. If it's not, then we, we have some things that we can do to, to help facilitate that. So it's a lot of information, as always. Um, but if you have questions, you can text or email me or write them down and bring them to class, and we'll get those answered for you. Have a great rest of your day, night, whatever it is when you're watching this, and I will see you soon.